The clematis vine can be a valuable resource for bushcraft and survival. The thicker parts of the woody vine can be crafted into a half board for bow drill. The thinner parts of the vine can be woven together to form a basket. Gently pull the vine down, gathering a mixture of thicker and thinner ones. Make a spider-like structure with three pieces of the large vine. Then use the thinner vine to weave in and out of each spoke, moving diagonally. With the base finished and about the size of your hand, then you can start to weave the thicker vines in and out of the spokes. To finish off, cut off the ends of each vine or fold them back into the basket. Leave two opposite ends remaining and lash these together to create a carrying handle. Now you have yourself a basket, which you can use to carry your wild edible food. The roots of many conifer trees grow relatively shallow, especially those of the pine species. Use a stick to dig through the soil to locate the thinner roots, which are near the surface. Follow the root along from the tree and gently prise it up. Take off the rigid outer layer of the root using two sticks or the back of your knife. This will expose the flexible inner layer. You can make the root more pliable by splitting it in half with a knife and peeling back the sides evenly. You can take this one step further by bashing the roots with a stick to break up the fibres. Soak them in water for an hour to make knot tying easier. You can use the root as is for simple bindings, or you can weave two or three roots together to make a stronger ply cordage. Use these roots to lash sticks together to make bushcraft shelters and primitive traps. But it's not just the roots of a tree that can be used for survival. The inner bark of some species, such as the western red cedar tree, can be peeled away and used in a similar fashion to the tree roots. You can make it more pliable by soaking it in water and tearing it into thinner pieces and weaving them together. Here you can see the inner bark to lash together a hazel frame when building a Native American wigwam. The inner bark of cedar can also be used to make fire. As the tree matures, the bark becomes rigid and fibrous, to the point where you can simply peel it off in thin strips. You'll need to break up the fibres first before you can get it to ignite. Do this by rubbing it between your hands to fluff up the inner fibres and separate them from the tough outer bark. Eventually, you will create a small tinder bundle. Now you can shower it with sparks from a fire steel and it should take to flame fairly easily. If you're prepared, you can make a number of these small tinder bundles and keep them in a fire lighting kit in your backpack. So you're ready to light fires whenever you next need to make up camp and shelter for the night. As if that wasn't enough, the bark can also be used to make tiles on the roof of a shelter. When a cedar log still has moisture in it, you can peel away the bark in one piece, using either your knife or a stick with a point on the end. Sometimes you might even be able to use your hands to gently prise the bark away from the log. I've used cedar bark on a number of different shelters, like this Native American wigwam, or this larger Viking style house. It's a brilliant resource for bushcraft and survival. But one thing to note when using it as a roofing material is to be aware that as the bark dries out, it will shrink and it can leave gaps in the roof of your shelter. So where possible, try and overlap the layers or double layer it. Many coniferous trees produce resin, a sticky glue-like substance that trees produce when wounded from broken branches or being attacked by various pests. Scrape the white resin off with your knife or a stick. I would recommend using a stick as it's a pain to get off your knife. Put it in a metal container and place this on the fire for a few minutes. Once melted, it will look like black tar. This is called pitch. It's highly flammable due to the high levels of resin, but while it is warm and malleable, wrap it around a stick and let this dry. Once dry, it sets hard as rock. This is nature's primitive glue, and now you can reheat it up and use it to seal joints on any timber frame shelters you build, or better still, use it to secure arrowheads to shafts. The flammable nature of this resin means that you can use it to make a torch or a candle. Carve out a rectangular piece of birch bark, then cut a small piece of wood which will act as the base of your candle. Take off the outer bark with your knife, grab some tree roots to use as your cordage, then cut off a thin piece of the birch bark to act as a wick. Wrap the rest of the birch bark around the piece of wood and tie this together with the tree roots. Now pour in your pieces of resin. Place the wick in and mold the resin around the wick to keep it straight and secure. Trim the wick down and light it up. Now you have yourself a resin candle, which can burn for over an hour. To help prolong the life of the candle, you can soak the birch bark in water beforehand. This will slow down the burning process. This tiny plant is known as the pig nut. Its Latin name is Conopodium magus. It kind of looks like the leaves of a carrot. But it's not what is above the ground that we are interested in here. Use a small stick to dig away at the base of the stem, being careful not to break it. Eventually, you will find a small tuber, which looks like a nut. Brush off the outer skin and dirt. 
and crunch away on the nut. It tastes a bit like hazelnut and is very high in calories for its size. Be aware, this plant is part of the Apiaceae family, which contains a number of plants which can kill you pretty quickly if you ingest them. Be sure that you have confidently identified it before consuming. Some conifer trees produce small blisters. Balsam fir and Douglas fir are classic cases of this. You can clearly see the blisters on this small Douglas fir. These blisters are full of resin. Use your knife or a stick to pierce the bark and collect the resin. This resin has antiseptic properties. If you have a small cut or graze, you can apply some of the resin to help prevent the cut from getting infected. As well as this, the resin is highly flammable and can burn for a long time. Shower it with sparks from a ferro rod and it should ignite easily. A live trap works well for catching animals or birds. Tie together two sticks at the top and bottom ends. If the cordage is slightly longer than the length of the sticks, then when you twist them over, it should make a rectangle with an X. Next, cut a lot of sticks of roughly equal length and diameter. Put the first stick underneath the X and roll it to the end of the cord, and then do the same at the other end. With the next stick, place it vertically and roll it to the end of the cord as far as it will go. Keep alternating sticks as you do this. Each time you put another stick in, it will tighten the cord. Eventually, you will have made a cage structure. To make the trigger, make a cut halfway through a small stick. Rotate it over and make another cut halfway through and a few inches away from the first cut. Snap the stick and you'll have two equal pieces. Now use a knife to thin out some of the material at the tips of the sticks. Lift up the trap and rest it on the trigger stick. Then place your bait stick in between the trigger stick and your trap is primed and ready. When the animal comes in and takes the bait, the trigger is set off and the cage falls down. Be sure to check your local laws on trapping, as in many countries this trap is illegal. Bugleweed is a common perennial plant that grows in shaded areas of deciduous woodlands. It's a member of the Lamiaceae family, and both the leaves and shoots are edible. However, it is more commonly used externally for the treatment of wounds. It contains substances that are also found in the digitalis plants, which have been used in treating heart conditions. More often than not, it is used as a homeopathic remedy to create medicated oils and ointments. It's good for throat irritations and mouth ulcers. Heterohelix, or common ivy, contains a high level of active compounds which can be used to make a form of laundry detergent or soap. The active compounds we are looking to extract from the leaves is the saponins. To do this, gather a handful of small leaves and crush them up. Put this in a container and fill with water. Let the water boil for around 15 minutes. Take the container off the fire and leave to cool. Then filter the water into another container and you'll now have made some entirely natural soap. Please note that this species of ivy is easy to handle. It is not like poison ivy. Be sure to positively identify any ivy before you handle it. The lesser spotted dogfish is very common in British waters. It can be caught by boat or from the shore. It is edible, although not eaten as much nowadays. The skin of the dogfish is very unique. It has the rough texture of sandpaper and was once highly sought after to use when sanding down furniture. Word of warning, if you are squeamish, you might want to skip the next part. But this is a survival video, so if you want to learn, then carry on watching. First, you dispatch the fish. This one was dispatched earlier. Then use a knife and a pair of pliers to peel off the skin of the fish. You can then use the skin straight away as sandpaper, or you can dry it out, which makes the denticles in the skin stand out more, which will make it more abrasive. The limpet is a marine gastropod mollusk, that is easily spotted clinging onto the rocks at low tide. Knock them off the rock with a stone. When you turn them upside down, you can see the yellow muscular foot. This is the edible part. You can either boil them or roast them upside down in their own shell. I boil them for around 10 to 15 minutes. They are tough, rubbery, and not very palatable. When boiled, the muscular foot separates from the shell. There is a black sac at the top which contains its guts. You can eat this, but I prefer to remove this part and then eat them. The bow drill is an effective method of primitive firelighting, and one of the best resources to use for bow drill is common hazel. Hazel tends to grow multiple shoots from the same tree, and many of these saplings grow straight. This makes it ideal for the bow drill. Split a hazel stick in half and then flatten it out with your knife. This can be used as the half board. Cut a small six to eight inch section of stick, round off one end and point the other end to make your spindle. Then use a slightly bent section to create your bow. You can even use a small piece of hazel as a bearing block to put pressure on the spindle. As long as the wood is dry, you can create an ember from a full hazel bow drill set. 
Another more primitive form of friction fire is the hand drill. Here I'm using a piece of elder which has a hollow pith, making it ideal for a hand drill spindle. For the hearth board I'm using clematis, the climbing vine which I used to weave the basket made right at the beginning of this episode. It requires more effort to create fire this way, but it still uses the same principles through friction, heat and oxygen to help you get that ember. Yellow Archangel is quite a menacing looking plant, with leaves similar to the stinging nettle and bright yellow flowers. It's in the Lamiaceae family, which is in the same family as mint. The leaves are in opposite pairs and as with many plants in the Lamiaceae family, the stem is actually square. Both the leaves and the flowers are edible raw, but mature plants would taste better if steamed or steeped in a tea. It has many medicinal properties, which include blood cleansing and alleviating stomach and abdominal cramps. One of the easiest traps to make is a spring pole snare. Find a small sapling that can easily bend. This will be your spring pole. Next, cut another small section and point it on both ends. Then cut one small twig off a branch, which will be used as a bait stick. And finally, cut another thin piece off, which will act as a trigger stick. Push the spring pole into the ground and tie some cordage to the tip of it. Make a hoop out of the other smaller stick and secure this into the ground. Then tie your trigger stick to the other end of the cord and place it under the hoop so that the pole is now under tension. Finally, add your bait stick underneath the trigger to stop it flipping back underneath the hooped stick. Lastly, place your snare loop over the trigger stick and bait stick. Place your bait around the base of this stick. Once a mammal investigates the bait, it will bump into the bait stick, which releases the spring pole and the snare loop slams tight. The birch polypore is a common bracket fungus that grows on birch trees. It can be dried, crushed up and steeped in a tea. It has many medicinal properties including anti-inflammatory, antifungal, antiseptic and more. It's a powerful tonic for the immune system, but the soft porous underside of this fungus also has some good uses while it's still fresh from the tree. If you use your knife to score out a rectangular shape, you can then peel this back and use it as a makeshift plaster or band-aid. Wrap it around any wounds on your fingers and gently compress it and it should hold its shape without you having to use any tape. You can also slice off a larger chunk of the fungi and once dried, it can be used as a knife strop to hone your knife edge out in the field. The best way to identify a silver birch tree is by its bark, which clearly has a white silvery tone to it. The great thing about this bark is that it is packed full of resin, which makes it great for lighting fires. Even when dead, the tree tends to rot from the inside out and so the bark is often the last part remaining. Use your knife to peel off a section of the bark, scrape some of the top layer into a fine dust pile. You'll notice it starts to go an orangey color. This is the resin. Put some sparks to the dust pile with your fire steel and it will ignite. It burns even when the bark is really wet, making it an ideal natural fire lighter. But it's not just the outer bark that can be used for bushcraft and survival. During the spring, the sap will rise up the tree carrying nutrients to the branches to grow new shoots and buds. You can literally tap into this part of the tree and gather the juicy sap to make an immune boosting drink. First, make a spile, a small piece of wood which will tap into the tree. I tend to use a green stick from the same branch growing from the tree to reduce the chance of the tree getting infected. Make a small upward cut into the tree with your knife. Place the stick inside this cut. It doesn't need to go deep into the tree as the sap layer is only just under the bark. Then tie off a container below the tap and leave for a few hours to collect the drips of sap. The sap tastes really refreshing and is packed full of goodness. You can drink it straight from the tree or add it to a tea. There are a number of small bushes and shrubs that have large thorns on them. The hawthorn is one such tree. The thorns that grow from this tree can be used to make a primitive fishing hook. Look for thorns that are pointing slightly upwards, snap off the stick either side of the thorn but leave enough on the area above the thorn to whip on some fishing line. In this instance, I used a simple whipping from some cordage I made from the stem of a stinging nettle. If you whip two thorns back to back so they are facing opposite each other, these can be used to make a gorge hook, which essentially gets stuck in a fish's throat as they swallow the bait and makes it much harder for them to fall off the hook. The cramp ball fungus grows on decomposing ash trees. Immature ones have a brown or maroon look to them, but once they turn black and go hard, they can be peeled off the tree and turned into a fire. Use a fire steel to shower sparks onto the soft underlayer of the fungus. If the fungus is dry, it will catch this spark and can then be blown into an ember. It glows like coal wood in a fire and it's sometimes referred to as the coal fungus. You can then use this glowing fungus in a tinder bundle such as this dead bracken here and it can be blown into a flame. 
The fungus can also be used in conjunction with some wet moss to create a mosquito repellent torch, which you can place around your camp to deter mosquitoes. If you find your fish hook is starting to get blunt and you don't have a hook sharpener in your kit, you can use a smooth stone. Look for these smooth flat stones by rivers, lakes or the sea. Hold the tip of your fish hook parallel to the surface of the stone and then drag it back and forth across the surface. Apply gentle pressure, but keep the angle the same throughout the movement. After eight to 10 strokes, lay the hook on its side and repeat the process. Then do the same to the other side. You're essentially sharpening three sides of the hook. You can do a quick test on the sharpness of the hook by putting the tip on your nail and turning your hand upside down. If it's sharp, it should hold in place on your nail and not fall off. Mentha aquatica, or water mint, can usually be found near water or damp woodlands. It can be steeped in a tea to help ease stomach problems, just like any other mint. It's also a great source of vitamin A, a fat-soluble vitamin that is critical for eye health and night vision. It's even been used to treat IBS. It's fairly easy to identify with its square stem and ribbed leaves. But the easiest way to identify it is to crush up the leaves in your hand. There should be a distinct minty smell to them. Water reed has been used as a building material for hundreds if not thousands of years. I've used it in a number of my builds. In this clip, I'm using it to make a roof on my Anglo-Saxon pit house. The reed is actually laid on the roof with the seed heads facing up. It seems contradictory, but the thicker and more sturdy part of the reed is more towards the stem, and this is where it hollows out more. This means that it can shed water much better, but can also take the weight of the bundle of thatch that is overlaid above it, without it bending and kinking. As the name suggests, it grows in water, but you do need a lot of it to create a waterproof roof. But if laid correctly, it can last 30 to 40 years before it needs replacing. Here's how you can make rope from a tree. Just find a small thin sapling about the thickness of your thumb or a little thicker. Grab the tip of the sapling and begin to twist it in your hands. As you twist it in your hands, start to rotate your arms too, as if you are demonstrating pedaling a bike. As you twist it, you will begin to hear the inner fibers of the sapling start to pop and give way, which will allow you to continue to twist it even more. Work your way down towards the base, and then when you can't twist anymore, cut it off. Now you have some rudimentary tree rope. Conditions were a little dry on this go, and so the fibers split a little too much. But if you look at this section here, you can see that the entire sapling is still intact, yet it is bendy and malleable like rope. Rotten tree stumps of conifer trees often have fragments of wood that is starting to decompose, but is not quite rotten yet. It's also usually packed full of resin, as when the tree dies, the resin is sent down to the root system to try and make it live. It's basic tree survival. This partially rotten wood is referred to as punk wood. Put fragments of the wood in a small metal tin and make a hole in the top. Place the tin on a campfire and let the wood inside start to char. Smoke will start billowing out of the hole and after a few minutes, the smoke will start to burn clearer. This is a sign that the charring process is complete. You will now have charred wood. Throw some sparks on it from a fire steel or use a flint and steel to help it ignite. Honeysuckle is a climbing plant found in woodlands and hedgerows. It comes to leaf fairly early in the year and the flowers and leaves contain salicylic acid, which can be used to treat headaches. The berries are toxic, so best to avoid those. The bark itself is flaky and can be peeled off and buffed together in your hands to create a tinder bundle. It does burn fast, so be sure to have more tinder material ready to pass on that early flame. Jack by the hedge or garlic mustard is a common wild edible that grows in woodland verges and hedgerows. It has distinctive heart-shaped leaves. When crushed, the leaves give off a mild garlic scent. When eaten raw, they are slightly bitter with a little kick of mustard. They are great when stuffed in fish or meat and cooked over the fire. Historically, the plant has been used to treat asthma, bronchitis and eczema. The A-frame shelter is one of the easiest and most efficient survival shelters to make. All you need is a long piece of wood to make a ridge pole and then lean some vertical sticks against this ridge pole on either side. Cover the sticks with moss or debris and you have yourself a survival shelter. You can also make an A-frame shelter from a tarpaulin. It sheds water really well and is good in strong winds. When by the sea, one of the first options for food is seaweed. There are a huge number of edible seaweeds out there. Here is some bladder rack. It can be eaten raw or boiled. The young tips are tender. It's high in iodine, fiber, vitamins, and minerals. Here is some sea lettuce found in rock pools. This one's high in protein and can be eaten raw or dried out and eaten like crisps. Here is some gut weed. It's very common in rocks that are high on the shoreline. You can eat it raw, but it's best fried over a fire to get the best flavor from it. Greater stitchwort 
is a common flowering plant that is edible, found in both woodlands and fields. The leaves are long, thin and lance shaped and each set of leaves is at opposite to the pair below it. The leaves and flowers are edible and go well in a wild food salad. Historically, it had been used to treat muscle aches and cramps, hence the name stitchwort. If you want to carry a portable fishing kit with you in your pack, you can make your own from a small stick. Carve away the bark from the lower section of the stick. This is where you can store your fishing line. Tie an arbor knot to secure your fishing line to the stick, then wrap it around the stick evenly. The deeper you cut this section, the more fishing line you can store on there. Use a piece of tape to secure the end of the fishing line and stop it unraveling. At the opposite end of the stick, create a hole using your knife. This can be used to store your fishing hooks and weights. Then carve another small piece of wood to act as a stopper cap. If you want some added grip for the handle, you can wrap some bank line around it. This can also be used for other things, such as stringing up a tarp or making a bow drill. Now the hand line is complete. All that is needed is to tie a hook on the end add a weight to it, cast your bait out and wait for that bite. If you wake up in the morning and find that your fire has completely gone out and there are no hot coals, you can still get a fire going from it. Pick up the powdered white ash and fine grains of charcoal. Place this into some cotton wool or dry fluffy tinder and roll it into a tube like a cigarette. Use a flat surface and a flat piece of wood, roll the cotton wool tube back and forward, applying pressure as you do it. This will create friction, which then creates heat. This heats up the ash and charcoal particles to a point where they start to combust. Add some more air to it and you can bring it to an ember. To make a wood drinking cup from a small log, cut off a piece about three inches in diameter and a height of roughly six inches. Batten the piece of wood into four separate pieces. Number each individual piece of log with a piece of charcoal or a stick covered in mud. This will help when you need to put them back together again. Then saw a groove about an inch above the bottom of the cup and use your knife to remove some material from the inner parts of these quarters. When you put the pieces back together again, you will have a cavity. Now just fasten the cup together again with some cordage. I use bank line as it doesn't tend to slip. Now your cup can hold water. However, it will leak some small drips, as inevitably water will always find a route out. To help seal it totally, you can use the tree resin as I showed earlier in the video, or you can soak it in water so that the wood expands and it seals the holes. The gorse bush is a common evergreen shrub found in coastal heathlands and on forest edges. It has nitrogen fixing roots, which means it can grow in poor soils. It has large spiky thorns and yellow flowers, which can appear year round. The flowers are edible, as are the buds. However, the seeds and seed pods are toxic. I find the flowers taste similar to almond and coconut. Moss is not only good for a bedding material and insulating bushcraft shelters, but it's also great for holding and storing water. If you don't have anything to carry water with you in a survival situation, you can soak the moss in a lake or river and allow it to absorb the water. It can carry a surprising amount. And on those really hot summer days, you can keep this damp moss with you and use it to cool down during the hotter hours of the day. A whistle is an ideal item to carry in your survival kit. They don't take up much space in your pack, and they are a great way of attracting attention. If you don't have a whistle on you, you can use a blade of grass to create a similar sound. Place the blade of grass between your thumbs so that the edge of the grass is facing you. Pinch your thumbs together and blow through the gap between them. Now you have a makeshift whistle, which can create just as much noise as a conventional whistle. And there's plenty more blades of grass about if one of them fails you. Alternatively, you can use the cap of an acorn to create a similar effect. This time, Put the acorn cap between the knuckles of your thumbs and create a V shape so that the top edge of the acorn cap is visible. Then blow air between the gap of your thumbs and across the edge of the acorn cap. It should produce a loud whistle. You can reuse the acorn cap hundreds of times, so it might be worth keeping one in your pack in case you need to use it. When it's raining and everything on the forest floor is wet, it can be tricky to get a fire going. If you split your wood down into fine kindling, it exposes the dry inner wood, which is much more likely to get a flame. Use your knife to slice fine curls of this dry inner wood to make feather sticks. Then hold your fire still against the feather stick and shower it with sparks. These fine curls should take a spark quickly and ignite into flame. Then just add more feather sticks on top and the rest of your dry kindling and soon enough you should have a fire. Greater reed mace is a common water-based plant that grows around lakes and pond shorelines. The roots of the plant, called rhizomes, are packed full of carbohydrates in the form of starch, 
and are generally available all year round. It's one of the best survival plants in terms of food. Clean up the rhizome and place it on a campfire and cook until blackened, around 20 minutes. Then peel back the outer layer, which reveals the inner fibres at the centre, which are edible. Beware of poisonous lookalikes though. The seed head of the plant is easy to identify, as it looks like a sausage on a stick. Peel back the outer layer to reveal hundreds of fluffy seeds. These can be ignited with a fire still and used as a tinder. It is a flash tinder though, so it burns quite fast. Another key survival plant is the dandelion. Widely available across Eurasia and North America, all parts of the plant are edible. It has distinctive sawtooth leaves and a prominent central white vein. The roots run deep and can be dried and ground down to make a coffee. The compound yellow flowers can be fried in a batter or eaten in salad. The stinging nettle, Urtica dioca, has been used as a herbal medicine for hundreds of years. They have one of the highest yields of vitamin C in any plant. The youngest leaves are generally the best tasting. To eliminate the sting, either hold them over a fire to blanch them, or put the leaves in a pot of boiling water and allow to steep for 10 minutes. They also make a really tasty soup. The stem of the stinging nettle can make fantastic cordage. Use your knife or thumb to prise open the pith of the nettle. Then peel back the outer strands. These are what will be used for the cordage. Begin to twist one of the strands between your fingers. Once twisted enough, you can bring your fingers together and it will naturally want to rotate on itself. This is the start of your cord. Now continue to roll it between your fingers, pulling it tight and back on itself after each roll. Eventually, you will have formed natural string, which, when dried, will become really tough. In the autumn, the sweet chestnut tree produces spiky cupules. Inside these spiky outer casings is a nut, the sweet chestnut. Gather some of these nuts and lightly roast them over a fire for 20 minutes. Peel back the outer hard shell to reveal the sweet, tasty inner nut. Historically, the nuts were ground down to make flour and added to bread recipes. The roots of fallen trees can provide temporary shelter, providing the weather conditions are right. In many cases, they do collect rainwater, and so it's best to first build a raised bed. Use some logs to raise the base of your bed up. As the tree root is already creating shelter at the back, I build two walls either side to reduce the amount of wind coming in. Then it was just a case of building the roof, using some horizontal logs, and then topping it with as much debris as possible, in this case, bracken. The pine tree has many uses for bushcraft and survival. The branches are full of resin, making them great for fire lighting. The wood itself burns fast, so getting a fire going with kindling is easy. The needles of the pine tree are packed full of vitamin C. They have five times the concentration of vitamin C than found in a lemon. They can bring relief to conditions such as skin complaints, heart conditions and fatigue. They are also high in vitamin A, which is good for your eyesight, improves hair and skin regeneration and improves red blood cell production. Put them in some boiled water and allow to infuse. Then take the needles out or filter and drink it. It's an immune system booster to help fight illness and infection. And that brings us to the end of the episode. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed it, feel free to subscribe. There's a whole lot more tips that can be found in my Wilderness Survival Skills playlist on my channel, which I will link to below. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.